health and friendship building ministries. After someone is befriended, we need to transition them to spiritual things. So we invite them to consider spiritual truth. We call this planting seeds. This we do in the local church by having literature, media, and invitation ministries. Once someone shows an interest in spiritual things, it's time to connect them with the whole message. And this is when we go deeper by engaging them in a series of full message Bible studies. We call this cultivating spiritual interest with Bible study. And in the local church, we need a ministry that can help with this, and we have that with our Bible study ministry. After someone studies the full message of the Bible, they need to be called to make a decision to follow Christ and be baptized. And this is called the harvest, harvesting decisions. And one of the best ways that we do that with a local church ministry is to conduct evangelistic meetings. And so we will be holding evangelistic meetings in the fall of this year. But after someone is baptized, they still need to be nurtured in spiritual habits, trained to be working for others themselves, and integrated into the life and mission of the church. This is what we call preserving the harvest, making sure that they are staying in the church and that they're active in the church. And the way the local church helps with this is to have a new member discipleship ministry. So each of these ministries you see on the screen are essential for the local church. But you'll notice there are some slight differences. The first ministry, health and friendship building ministries, usually what we do with that is we hold cooking schools, dinner with the doctor, uh, we might do a, a concert, a vacation Bible school, various different things. These are all church programs that we have. Literature, media, and invitation ministries, mostly what we do is equip and train members to engage in personal ministry, sharing literature, inviting people to study the Bible or what have you. Bible study ministry is mostly a personal ministry thing. It's something that the church does is to train the members to be involved in personal ministry. Then for evangelistic meetings, again, that's a church program, a church-wide program. Then new member discipleship ministry is more something where we have a ministry that assigns mentors to new members where they personally mentor them. And as a result of this, this is what most churches look like. Most churches are strong, fairly strong in preparing the soil that's befriending because we can do church programs to do it. And they're fairly strong at harvesting because we can do a church program, an evangelistic meeting to do it. But they're fairly weak at planting and cultivating and preserving because it requires individual members to engage in personal ministry to make it happen. And personal ministry, if you haven't ever heard this, is Christ's method of ministry. Amen. You look in all the statements about Christ's method and you will find that it's always personal ministry. So this is very important. And this is why we believe that Bible studies are so important. Now, last week, I shared with you the brief history of Bible studies and how uh, Ellen White told uh, one of our pioneers, Stephen Haskell, that she had had this uh, vision. She says, in visions of the night, representations passed before me of a great reformatory movement, a reformation among God's people. What did she see? Hundreds and thousands were seen visiting families and opening before them the Word of God. And she said she saw that they were using a question and answer method. Question, Bible answer. Question, Bible answer. Just like our, common day, uh, our, our modern day Bible studies. Back then they called them Bible readings. And Ellen White said the plan of holding Bible readings was a heaven-born idea. Because here was a way to spread the message that God has given us that was not dependent upon the pastors. That's why it was so powerful, was because the lay people could now, we have so many more lay people than we have pastors, hundreds and thousands she saw, going and sharing the Bible in this way. Bible studies are a ministry for lay people. For pastors, true, but also for lay people. Now let me tell you why Bible studies are so important by showing you a funnel. This funnel describes the work of leading someone to Christ and to baptism. And there are many ways that people get introduced to the church, maybe through a cooking school, a church social, a concert, community service, a vacation Bible school, and ultimately we desire that they become a baptized member, a disciple of Christ. But here's the interesting thing. Someone can come to a cooking school and be introduced to the church that way and become a baptized member without ever coming to a concert 
Or they can be introduced to the church through a vacation Bible school and become a baptized member without ever going to a church social. But everybody who becomes a member has to go through the neck of the funnel. And do you know what the neck of the funnel is? Bible studies. Bible studies. But here's the problem in local churches around the world. Over 95% of the members in most churches only want to work at the top of the funnel. And very few members want to work in the neck of the funnel, which everyone who becomes a baptized member must go through. This is the longest part of the process, the part where you're actually going through Bible studies, reading them together with someone and helping them to become comfortable with the message of the Seventh-day Adventist Church and to embrace it. This is why we need more people, more lay people, who are willing to give Bible studies. If instead of two or three, we had 20 or 30 willing to give Bible studies in a local church, imagine the growth. This is the greatest potential for growth in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Ellen White says, many are on the verge of the kingdom, waiting only to be gathered in. She says, let ministers teach church members that in order to grow in spirituality, if we want to grow spiritually, we must carry the burden that the Lord has laid upon us. That's the burden of leading souls into the truth. We need to have a burden that people understand and learn the Seventh-day Adventist message, that which is given to us in Scripture. So she says, open the scriptures to someone that is in darkness and you will not complain of weariness and lack of interest in the cause of truth. Your heart will be awakened to an anxiety for souls. Then joy in the evidence of the faith will fill your heart and you will know that he that watereth shall be watered also himself. This is one of the best ministries to change your life. And your spiritual life will grow like nothing else if you just make yourself willing to walk someone through a series of Bible studies. One last quotation. The more one tries to explain the word of God to others, what happens? The plainer it becomes to himself. We need that love for souls that this quote tells us that will lead us to step out of our comfort zone and share the Bible with others. Plan to come and be trained at the end of March with this special Bible study training, and you can be one of the hundreds and thousands that Ellen White saw at the end of time giving Bible studies to others. God bless you. Thank you so much, uh, Pastor Jim. Now I understand why Seventh-day Adventist members know so much about the Bible, because they go through Bible studies. And uh, you will remember that uh, many people from other denominations, when they, they come to our homes and they knock on our doors and they want to engage in Bible studies with us, when we tell them that we're Seventh-day Adventists, they get scared a little. Oh, these people, they do know the Bible. And we encourage each one of our members so that we can be engaged in Bible study, in teaching the Bible to not only to our members, not only to our children, but those who are becoming church members too. We have a few announcements uh, to share this morning. And the first one, uh, you received a, a sheet of paper uh, when you came in this morning. And we need to have our nominating committee uh, start working so that they can elect those church members that are going to be leading the church in different uh, departments here at church. So you received uh, this uh, sheet of paper. If you did not, I see Alex there, uh, one of our deacons. Uh, if you can put your hand up so that he can give you uh, one of these uh, sheet of papers. And you need to put there five names that you consider should be the nominating committee. Those uh, members that will check on our names and will check on the names of our, our church members so that they can propose to us who are those that are going to be leading our church in the different departments for the years 24 and 25. Uh, there's a little asterisk there. And it's not that we want to dismiss uh, these people that have uh, that asterisk. 
They have been working in our church. They're members of our church. But because they served on the nominating committee uh, last year, we are asking them to kindly not participate this year in the nominating committee. They will be, for sure, they will be able to serve in other departments uh, in the church, but not in the nominating committee. So please check on the names. Mark five that you consider that they should be part of the nominating committee. And when our deacons come uh, to get the offerings in a little while, you can hand these uh, sheets of paper also uh, to them. We do have other announcements, and I am going to ask Beth that she comes up here, and she's going to share with us also an announcement that uh, she has for the church. So good morning, everybody. Is everybody ready for tomorrow? What's tomorrow? Awesome. So 10, 10.30 tomorrow morning. Rachel and Justin are going to school us in all the fine arts of kimchi. And remember, this isn't just one kind of kimchi. For those that are like, no, nope, want no part of that. Um, there's different flavors that Rachel's been working hard on. And so it's going to be exciting um, to see what they have in store for us. Um, I'm also excited to say I've had several women reach out to me via email. Um, and they, there's some other options that are in the works for the months to come. So I'll be sharing more about that soon. Perfect. And for those of, you, those of you that don't know what kimchi is, come tomorrow. All right? Uh, Tony, you have also an announcement uh, that you want to make this morning. Happy Sabbath. Good to see everyone. So I'm here, here on behalf of Men's Ministries to remind you, starting with Men's Ministries, that a week from tomorrow, Sunday morning, is it March 3rd? We have Rick Perez going to be here. Rick Perez is going to be here. Some of you know him. He's a mechanic. And last summer, late summer, he and I, st we were talking, and he was uh, telling me funny stories. He's been a mechanic. He just retired for 48 years. And he was telling me stories that I just thought were funny. He would tell me, I won't tell them all, because it might be some of you, I don't know, because he's worked on a lot of our cars. But he would tell stories about people that bring their car to him because a particular light is on the dashboard and they didn't need to. And he has people who keep driving when a certain, another light comes on, but they shouldn't have. And so just kind of talking through about things um, over months and knowing him for many years, this idea came together of like, we need you, Rick, to come tell us, us, the average driver, things to pay attention to, not pay attention to in our cars. Now, many of you know much about your cars, but a lot of us don't. And I used to ask him, like, well, I'm embarrassed to say this, but this is being recorded too, isn't it? It is. I was like, Rick, do I really need to worry so much about rotating my tires? Like, really? I don't really see the point of that. And some of you might think that also. And so if you know the reason that you should rotate your tires, good for you. If you don't, and why it matters and why you're going to pay more because you don't, talk to me. Um, and so we're going to be doing this next Sunday morning, and you're invited to come here. Bring a friend, bring a neighbor, someone, and uh, bring your questions. So it's not just everything. He's just going to share things, but answer questions. And uh, we're going to have pizza at the end of that. That's going to be sponsored by the men's ministries and... Women's ministries, because we're always about the feeding part, right? No, no, no. So I just want to add, um, Tony and I talked about this, as you can tell. So I, many of you know, I'm the only girl with all brothers. And when it came time for me to get my license, my dad quickly um, let me know that it wasn't just about getting a license and speeding off down the road. I had to know some basics about my, the vehicle that I was driving. And so I would like to encourage not just the men to come out and be gearheads, and this is not going to be a crash course in becoming a gearhead, but it's really important that we understand and know too, one, so we're not taken advantage of when we do need to take it to a mechanic, because there's not a lot of Rick Perez's in the world, and what we, what, how, what we need to be looking for when those lights come on. So this isn't just a guy thing. Um, the guys invited us girls along too, and I really encourage those of you who are either coming up and soon will be getting your license, and even those that some have had your license for a while. Come on out and see what Rick's got to share. 
Thank you very much. So for all those men in the church that think that they know it all, they can have the excuse that you're bringing your wife to learn. But I'm sure that you will be more than educated uh, on that Sunday. So we invite everyone to be here at, uh, at our church on uh, the following Sunday. Not tomorrow, but the next one. We also have a second reading for um, members that are coming into our church and members that are leaving our church. And I am going to read it out of our bulletin. If you want to open your bulletin and you want to know who are those that we're voting for today, uh, you can see it there. The second reading is for Sarah Klingweil, that uh, she is becoming a member of the Linz uh, Church in Austria. Also, our own John Wesley Taylor and Miriam Taylor that uh, are being a, going to be accepted at the Berrien Springs Pioneer Memorial Church. He is a president of Andrews University, so we cannot keep him any more here in our church. Um, we also have Joshua, Kimberly, Ethan, and Callie Rosales that are moving over to the Tapahannock. Okay, that, yeah, uh, in Virginia. And uh, we, although we hate to see our members leave our church, we know that and we're happy that they are going to be so much involved in their own churches where they're living right now that they will leave a Triadelphia mark in their own churches. So I am going to ask our members, all of you that are uh, willing to give a letter of recommendation for the churches that they're going to, if you can raise your hand. All of you that don't want them to leave, but realize that they have to leave, uh, but uh, want to say something different, can you put up your hand? Good, we are going to be able to tell them that they're going to be members of their uh, new churches. And um, we want to encourage each one of you to open your Bibles in Psalm chapter 98, verses 1 through 3. Psalm 98, verses 1 to 3. Uh, as that will be our call to worship reading this morning. And I read from the Bible. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have gained him the victory. The Lord has made known his salvation. His righteousness has revealed in the sight of the nations. He has remembered his mercy and his faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Amen. We say amen to these promises from our uh, God. And I would want to ask you that uh, we all kneel down for our prayer this morning. Once again, dear Lord, we want to thank you for the Sabbath day. We want to thank you, dear Lord, because you allow us to have the freedom to come to your church, your place of worship, not only so that uh, we can engage in conversation, in dialogue, and in study of the Bible, but we can also fellowship together. We want to ask you, dear Lord, that you please be with us this morning. Especially, we want to ask you that you anoint Pastor Sam as he shares his thoughts with us. May we keep those thoughts, may we learn from them, and may we share them also with those that don't know you yet. 
In Jesus' name we ask, amen. 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 Opening hymn, let's open our hymnals to hymn number 21, Immortal, Invisible, God, Only Wise. We will sing verse 1, 3, and 4, and you can stand. seated. It's now time for our call for the offering, and the Hope Rising Committee has met, and I want to give first a brief report from the Hope Rising Committee where they reviewed where we stand on the money that we are raising for the church renovations. And we're very happy about where we are, but we have a good ways to go yet. And so, the Hope Rising Committee has recommended to our entire congregation that we each consider giving up to 2% more in our giving toward Hope Rising. Maybe uh, you can give a little bit more than that. Maybe you can't give quite that much. But if you could consider increasing your funding to Hope Rising, your offerings to Hope Rising, it would be appreciated for this reason. Any money that is not raised will be used through the Columbia Union Revolving Fund. And for every dollar that we use through the Columbia Union Revolving Fund, uh, or, or rather, I should say, every dollar that we raise where we don't have to use the revolving fund, we will save 49 cents. So it's a pretty considerable amount that we save if we can have less to, uh, to borrow, and wouldn't it be great if we didn't have to borrow a thing? Um, so the Hope Rising Committee has asked that we look to increase our percentage of giving toward Hope Rising if the Lord impresses your heart to do so. Now, our regular offering appeal today is for Chesapeake Advance. And uh, you might, Chesapeake Advance, of course, helps uh, with evangelism and uh, with our camp and with many things in our conference. Um, and you may be wondering how to increase for Hope Rising and give toward Chesapeake Advance and keep giving your liberal offerings to the local church budget. So for our offering appeal today, I'm going to copy an offering appeal that I've heard in the past.
from when I was in Ohio years ago, it was probably the most well-crafted and beautifully articulated offering appeal I ever heard. So I'm going to try my best now to share it with you. It goes like this. Simplify. Will the deacons please stand? Our Father in heaven, we're so grateful for the privilege of being able to give. We wouldn't be able to give if you had not first given to us. And so, Father, we pray that you would bless the funds that will be collected just now. Bless the individuals who will give. But also, Lord, that you would work upon our hearts to consider how we might give even more liberally in the future. So bless us now, Lord, with your presence, and bless these funds for the furtherance of your kingdom, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. It's now time for our children to come forward and take a basket, and we will be taking up an offering of whatever you might want to liberally give today for Christian education. Thank you. Two eighteen. while they are picking up the offering, when he cometh. When he comes, when he comes, to make up his church. Precious jewels, his love to and his own. Like the stars above and in this bright ground, adore him. They shall shine in their beauty, bright. 
hello, boys and girls and everyone else. It's good to see you this morning. Um, I'm going to say something, and I'm going to see if you guys know what you're supposed to say back. Happy Sabbath! Happy Sabbath! <laughs> it's so good to see you. I'm going to tell you a story today of when I was a little girl. Now, my children love every evening to have a story time. And they always ask, Mommy, tell me a story when you were a little girl. And so today, I'm going to tell a story of when I was a little girl. When I was a little girl, I had, and I still have, a brother and a sister. And my brother and sister are older than I am. I have a sister who's way older than I am. No, she's not that much older. <laughs> and I have a brother who's in between. So I have my sister who's the oldest, and then there's my brother, and there's me. And my brother and I used to play together all the time because my sister's a little bit older, so she didn't play with us as much. And one thing we liked to play with was we love to play in our tree house. Do you guys know what a tree house is? Yeah, it's a house that's in a tree, but it's not a big house, like a house that you live in kind of house. It's a little house that's in a tree. Yeah, maybe more like that, but it was a little bigger than that. But you know what? We would go up and we, we, we had this little ladder that we'd go and we'd go up to the top and we'd look out and survey the land to see who was coming. And we love to do that. So we would go and we'd look and we'd say, hello out there. And then we would play some games and we'd go up and down and around the tree house. Well, we also had something called a pulley. Now, I don't know if you know what a pulley is, but it's something like this. You have a rope that's wrapped around um, a stable thing, something that's stuck in place. So it was a tree branch. We had it wrapped around. And then you have two parts. You have one over here, one over here. And we had a weight on one side that was heavy. And then on the other side, we had a platform, like a flat piece. And what we would do is if we wanted to get something from down below on the ground, we'd stick it on the platform. And it had to be lighter because the heavy thing goes down. So it had to be lighter. And then the, we'd put, pull on the weight. And it'd go, I can't do it because I, I don't have two hands here. Hold on. Awesome. Okay, perfect. So then what we would do is we wanted something to go down. We'd take the weight off, and then it'd go whoosh, down to the bottom. <gasps> it was so much fun. Well, one day, thank you so much, my brother had the brilliant idea that we could get on the pulley system and go faster than if we climbed the tree. <gasps> do you think that's a good idea or a bad idea? It's a bad idea. But you know what? Sometimes when our brains are not fully developed, we think things are good ideas when they're bad ideas. And so we decided we would try it. But we made the wise decision of telling my mother before we tried it, because it was lunchtime. So we went in for lunch and we said, Mommy, we're going to go up the pulley instead of the ladder. And my mother said, No, you're not, because that's not a wise decision. Oh, but we thought we were so wise. We thought, mm, I don't know about that. So we got outside and we started discussing what my mother had said. We started talking about it. And I said, well, we probably should listen. And this was the one time when generally my brother and I, when we got into mischief, we agreed on mischief. But in this one, I said, I think it probably would be better if we didn't do that. But you know what my brother said? Oh, well, I, we could just try it once. It might not hurt anything. And I, instead of listening to my mother, now sometimes somebody might tell us, hey, it's okay if you do this, even though somebody told you not to. Should you listen to that person or should you listen to what's right? You listen to what's right. Just because somebody else says, oh, it's okay, it's not gonna do anything, should you listen? No, it's especially if your mommy and daddy say, don't do that. Well, we thought we knew better, um, and so we decided we would try it. So my brother decided he was going to get on one side because he was a little heavier, and he was going to go on this side, and he would hold me down, and I 
And I'm going to use the angel because I was such an angel when I was a child. No, I'm just kidding. It's the only one I had. So, <laughs> okay. And then I went on the other side because I was lighter. So I got on the other side, and he got on the one side, and he started to pull me up way, way up. <gasps> and I got to the very top, and it was really cool. But do you know what happens when a rope has been rubbing on something for too long? It starts to fray, which means it starts to not be as strong. And so if you put something heavy on a rope that's not very strong, what's going to happen? It's going to break. So I got to the very top, and guess what happened? It broke. And I was at the very top of a very high place. And instead of coming down gently like my brother said I was going to do, <laughs> I came down very quickly, bam, right down on the ground. Oh, it did not feel good. And I had the breath knocked out of me. I don't know if you know what that means. It means you're like, huh, and you can't talk. You can't do anything. You're just sitting there like, oh, oh it's a scary experience. And my brother, he came running over. And the first thing he said was, don't tell mom. Because guess what? He had figured out that one, gravity works. And two, my mom was right. And three, if mommy found out, there would be consequences. And, but guess what happened? I took a deep breath and went, mom, at the top of my lungs. And guess who came running? Mom came running. And she told us, you know what? I do think that you have had a very valuable lesson today. And Ruthie, you are sore enough. I don't think you need any more consequences. <laughs> because I landed on a very sensitive part of my body. And I landed very hard. <laughs> so she did not give us any consequence at that point. Because we had had a big consequence right then. I think my brother might have had one. I don't know. But I didn't remember. But I know I didn't because I um, was hurt enough. And you know what? <clears throat> that is a lesson to me. Just because. When that, whenever in life I learned from that. Because I thought, you know what? Next time somebody tells me to do something I know my mommy or daddy has told me not to do, I'm going to listen to my mommy and daddy. Because I was hurting for a long time. Thankfully, I didn't break any bones. And I was, didn't get killed or anything like that. Because that could have happened. I could have died. Or I could have been hurt even worse. But because Jesus spared me, and I'm very thankful for that, I could learn that lesson of when mommy and daddy tell me to not do something, I shouldn't listen to anybody else. I need to listen to what my mommy and daddy are telling me. And you know what? It's the same. When Jesus tells us something, we want to listen and not listen to other people who say, oh, I don't know. It might be okay. Let's listen to Jesus. Say, I'm going to do what Jesus tells me to do. Because the other way, we can get hurt really badly. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for life lessons. Thank you that you are helping these boys and girls to listen to you. Help them to always listen to what you have to say. And when other people say, hey, it's okay. It's not going to hurt you. Help them to listen and say, no, I'm not going to do that because Jesus has asked me not to. Help us be like you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.
Thank you, Sue and Vanilla, for putting your talents to the Lord, Amen. giving your talents to the Lord. May he bless them as you have blessed us. This morning for the Sabbath thought and uh, the scripture reading, we should open our Bibles in Matthew chapter 26, verses 6 to 9. And if you open your programs in the second page, you will have the Sabbath thought, which I will read this morning. Usually you have a mother and a daughter, a father and a son, a husband and a wife here. But today, uh, Susan was supposed to be with me, but uh, she was feeling under the weather. And I have to recognize that uh, it took me a couple of years to understand that saying, feeling under the weather. I had to ask somebody, what do you really mean by that? But um, I will do my best to, to do her part. If you open your program, let's read together the Sabbath thought. And let's read it out loud, each one of us. The woman who bore spices to the tomb found their errand in vain. For he had risen. But Mary, pouring out her love upon the Savior while he was conscious of her devotion, was anointing him for the burial. And as he went down into the darkness of his great trial, he carried with him the memory of that deed, an earnest of the love that would be his from his redeemed one's forever. And Matthew 26, verses 6 to 9, on the same story, goes on saying, And when Jesus was in Bethany, at the house of Simon the leper, a woman came down to him having an alabaster flask of very costly fragrant oil, and she poured it on his head, as he sat at the table. But when his disciples saw it, they were indignant, saying, Why this waste? For this fragrant oil might have been sold for much and given to the poor. May the Lord bless Pastor Sam as he shares his message, God's message to us. Good morning, church family. It's been a while, hasn't it? Yes, but we've been blessed by some incredible speakers here at our church. Amen? Um, last week, we had um, Sister Audrey Anderson. Powerful message. Amen? Were you blessed? I was incredibly blessed. And then the week before, we had our Pathfinders and Adventures. Amen? What an amazing, amazing message they gave us about putting on the full armor of God. And we have much to be grateful for, amen? God's grace, amazing grace toward each one of us. And in many ways, I am grateful um, for one more year of life, amen? amen. On Wednesday, um, some of you know it was my birthday, and then last week, um, Elder Remmers um, shared with, with our church family during our fellowship lunch and got to hear happy birthday and, and grateful also for my wife because on Friday was her birthday. Some of you know that as well. And so, so we get to celebrate um, together the same month. And some of you also um, had a birthday this month of February. But again, just seeing how merciful God is. Amen? He's taking care of us up to this very moment. And I would like to also express my gratitude for my parents, who I got to see a few weeks ago and got to spend time with dad and mom. And as some of you know, mom had a stroke and she's recovering and she's doing actually pretty good. She doesn't think so. But we all think she's doing pretty good. She can walk, amen? 
She can speak, amen? And she can still use a little bit of her left arm, amen? And that's a lot of improvement from where she was in the month of November. She was in the hospital. She was not doing well at that moment, but she's doing much better. And so we continue to pray for one another, amen? And we continue to encourage one another. And today's sermon is is about that. It's about God's amazing grace toward each one of us. His mercies are amazing, brothers and sisters. And the reason why we come to church is to show our gratefulness, amen? And to let people know that there is a God who cares for us, who's taking care for us. Now, I know this week we also received some sad news. Yes, and so we are praying for Sister Linda, amen? We're praying for her health. And um, tomorrow also as a church, we have the opportunity of coming together with our dear sister, Gail Prince. And tomorrow there's a memorial service at 4.30 p.m. here at our church. And we'll have an opportunity once again to show our love to the Prince family and to let them know that Jesus is coming again. And there is hope of being with our loved ones in a beautiful place that Jesus has gone to prepare for each one of us. So the context of today's message, a theme um, takes place in, in, you find it in Matthew 26, It's a story that starts off by telling us that Jesus, after speaking, after preaching, and talking about the time of the end in Matthew 24 and 25, he said to his disciples, you know that after two days is the Passover, and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. That message went in this ear from the disciples and went out the other. It's like Jesus never said it. They had another plan. Their plan was better. Jesus was supposed to be the king of Israel. Jesus was supposed to reign among his people. Jesus was supposed to get rid of the Romans who were oppressing his people. But Jesus said, you know that after two days is the Passover and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. You see, Jesus knew that There were those who did not like them, like him. There were those who were plotting to kill him. And these were the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders of the people. In fact, they assembled at the palace of the high priest, who was called Caiaphas. And they plotted to take Jesus by trickery and kill him, Matthew tells us. They did not want Jesus to be around. They wanted to kill him. But they knew that they had nothing against him. Nobody could say anything bad about him. So they had to lie about it. And somehow they were trying to get some help from the state and see if they could together take care of this situation. But they also recognized that it was Passover, A time when a lot of people came to Jerusalem, a lot of those who knew Jesus would be there, and they thought, oh, it's not a good time for us to do this, lest there be an uproar among the people. So in this context, Matthew tells us, Mark tells us, Luke tells us, And yes, John tells us. It's the one story that appears in all four Gospels. The story 
of a woman. The story of a woman who was known to live in the city and who was known as a sinner. But praise the Lord, it's not just the story of a woman who was known to be a sinner, but it's also the story of Jesus and his amazing grace. Amen? It's the story of Jesus and his compassion, his love for all people. Yes, even those of us who make mistakes. Amen? Even those of us who fail. Even those of us who sin. And this story takes place, Matthew tells us there in verse 6, as Magdiel read in our scripture reading, takes place in Bethany, which was not far away from Jerusalem. And it says here that it took place in the house of Simon the leopard. Now, John tells us that it happened in the house of Lazarus, Martha, and Mary. Well, maybe this was the house of Simon, and he was letting them use it as well. Yes? Now, Simon, who was Simon? Luke tells us he was a Pharisee. Somebody you could say an honorable man. But Matthew tells us Simon was what? A leper. Now, isn't that the case, brothers and sisters? Most people know us sadly or remember us sadly by the things we do wrong. Yes? Simon the what? The leper. Mary the sinner. People don't remember us by the good things we do. Word gets around pretty quickly when somebody does something bad, huh? It runs like fire. <sighs> Did you hear? Oh. And this was a case with Simon too. They ate at the house of Simon the leper. Matthew doesn't give us the name of Mary, but John does. A woman came to him having an alabaster flask of very costly, fragrant oil, and she poured it on his head. And as he sat at the table, as he sat at the table, but when his disciples saw it, they were indignant, saying, Why this waste for this fragrant oil? might have been sold for much and given to the poor. What did Mary do? She brought some very expensive, fragrant oil. And she decided that she wasn't going to wait until Jesus died but she was going to give him this gift before he died. Someone was listening, amen? Not the disciples. Not Simon. But Mary. Mary was listening. She heard Jesus. I'm going to be betrayed and I will be crucified. And she decided that moment she was going to do something very special. She would give Jesus a gift. John tells us one pound of this precious oil. I looked up on the computer. How much is a pound? It's about two cups. Eight ounces for a cup, yes, 16 ounces for two. And I also went on the internet and tried to find out 
What are some of these expensive fragrances that are out there today? And I found out that for one eighth of an ounce of jasmine oil, you would have to pay today $96. Doesn't sound too bad. To make one pound of oil, it takes two, I'm sorry, 2,000 pounds of flowers. 2,000 pounds. Is that how much a car weighs? About 2,000 pounds? Yes? Approximately depending on the size. So an ounce of this jasmine oil would cost today $768. And a cup, which is half a pound, about $6,144. So a pound is about $12,288 of jasmine oil. This is what is used to make perfumes. I found that out. Now, this is not the most expensive oil out there. There's another one. And this is um, Bulgarian rose oil. Husbands, if you want to give the precious gift to your wives, <laughs> you want to hear how much this would cost? It cost $237 for one-eighth of an ounce. For one ounce, that would be $1,896. For one cup of this oil, which is half a pound, Fifteen thousand one hundred and sixty-eight, and for a pound, thirty thousand three hundred and thirty-six dollars. It takes ten thousand pounds of rose petals to distill one pound of the highly coveted rose. I don't know, the Bible doesn't tell us how much time and how much money this oil, this precious, fragrant oil cost. But it was enough to get the disciples upset. Yes? They were like, what? $10,000 just went down. 30000 and to tell you the truth, these are not the most expensive. There's still others that are a lot more expensive. It was enough to get Judas upset about what had just transpired. And not only was Judas upset, but also the host was upset, Simon. Luke tells us that Simon was also a little disappointed because Jesus should have known better. This woman was a sinner. And Jesus allowed her to touch his feet, to dry his feet with her hair. But Jesus, like always, responds differently. Amen? And he said to them, Why do you trouble the woman? For she has done a good work for me. Mary did a good work for who? For Jesus. That was the difference. She wasn't doing it for herself but she was doing it for Jesus. And Jesus understood this. Jesus accepted this. Jesus was encouraged by this. 
Someone's listening. Amen? Someone's understood the message. For pouring this fragrant oil on my body, she did it for my burial. And then Jesus says the following words, Assuredly I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. Can we praise God for this? This story, wherever the gospel is being shared, including here at Tridelphia, this story will be shared as a memorial to her. Jesus could have done this very differently. He could have said, Judas, you know, I know exactly what, why you're upset. I know exactly why you want this money. And it's not for the poor. It's not to help the poor. But you want it for yourself. But did Jesus have compassion on Judas? He had great compassion on Judas also. And didn't expose him then. If we turn our Bibles to Luke chapter 8, I'm sorry, Luke chapter 7, we'll find there what Jesus tells Simon. And I think this is very important. Luke chapter 7 and verse 40. And Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. So he said, teacher, say it. There was a certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. And when they had nothing with which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, Therefore, which of them will love him more? And Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he said to him, You have rightly judged. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet with her tears, and wiped them with the hair of her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore, I say to you, her sins, which are many, are Forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. Then he said to her, Your sins are forgiven. Are our sins forgiven, brothers and sisters? Amen. Have we received an amazing gift from God? Do we recognize how much he has done for each one of us? Were the people at the table happy? It says here, those who sat at the table with him began to say to themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And among them was Judas. Judas started to question Jesus, who said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. If we go back to Matthew, chapter 26, we find what G Judas did right after this moment. And one of the 12, called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and said, what are you willing to give me? 
Isn't that the problem of most of our sins, brothers and sisters? We're only thinking about who? Me. It's selfishness. What are you willing to give me if I deliver him to you? And they counted out to him 30 pieces of silver. And from that time, he sought opportunity to betray him. What good work can we do for Jesus? You might think, I don't have 10,000. I don't have 5,000. But what good work can you and I do for our Lord and Savior? And I praise God for Matthew chapter 25. Amen? Because right before there, Jesus tells his disciples, whoever does this to the least of them, you've done it unto me. Whoever gives a cup of water to one of the least of these, gives a cup of water to Jesus. Whoever feeds one of the least of these, gives food to Jesus. Whoever clothes one of the least of these, gives clothes to Jesus. What kind of work is Jesus calling you and me to do for him? Do we have good news to share? Can we encourage one another? Can we pray for one another? Can we ask the good Lord to help us, to change us, to be kind to one another? Amen? What Mary did was basically just show gratitude in the best way she could, understanding that Jesus was about to die she used what she had. She bought this gift deserving of a king like Jesus. She looked for the opportunity. This was at her uncle's home. She gave it with courage, without doubt. She was glad happy to do this and sorry that Jesus would have to die for her sins. And what does Jesus do? He accepts it. Amen? He rejoices. And the quote that was read from Desire of Ages tells us that when Jesus was going through those difficult moments, guess what he remembered? He remembered the gift that Mary gave her. He remembered that yes, there are sinners in this world, but sinners who have been forgiven, amen? And sinners that love God with all of their heart, might, and strength. And sinners who want to live a different kind of life, amen? And from then on, Mary was no longer going to be remembered as this city woman who was a sinner. But now, she was going to be remembered as the one person who understood the message, who gave this beautiful gift, this precious, fragrant oil, anointing the Son of God for the mission that he had come here to fulfill. Are we grateful, church family, for what God has done for us? Do we show this by being kind to one another, by praying for one another? And as Pastor Jim Howard um, shared with us, by also sharing these truths with others, amen? We, we have a beautiful message. And the message is, Jesus is coming soon, amen? And he wants to take us home, amen? And we're going to live in a better place, amen? And we have many gifts and talents that God has given us to share with others. 
Will we do this? By God's grace, by his amazing grace, we can do this and be remembered by the good things we do for Jesus. Amen. Closing hymn is hymn number 187. Jesus, what a friend for sinners. Amen. You may stand. wonderful Savior, brothers and sisters. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, what a privilege to be able to call you our Father and to call Jesus our friend, a friend who loves us, a friend who cares for us, a friend who wants the best for each one of his, his friends. And Father, we Thank you for the amazing gift that Jesus came to give to each one of us. He came to give something more precious than jasmine oil. He came to give something more precious than rose oil. He came to give us his blood, his amazing blood. It gives us power to live differently. It gives us power to love one another. It gives us power to share the gospel wherever we go. And Father, this day we come before you asking for those mercies 
to be poured upon each one of our hearts. We thank you for your forgiveness. We thank you for your love. And Father, what we ask is for your blessing to be a witness to the world of what you have done for each one of us. So we praise you and we give you glory. And we do this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Yeah. Um.